Well, church, how are we doing this morning? Y'all, I don't know if it gets better than this. Beautiful day, incredible worship, two baptisms, and 41 to 38. Whoops and giggums. I'm going to need some help today. I'm kind of tired. I know a lot of you are too, uh, but it's so great to be with you. My name is Daniel Lumpy. I was brought on staff uh, right out about a year ago to hang out over in Loft across the parking lot, be the Loft pastor over there. Uh, mostly my job is to try to keep Rob Renfro in line. Pray for me if you don't mind. <laughs> Uh, and this morning, we are continuing this sermon series on Nehemiah, looking at week two on seeing opportunities. And so here on the front end, I would be remiss if I didn't take a, a moment and, and just appreciate and, and kind of soak in this opportunity that I have. Um, this is an amazing opportunity for me, and I just want to say thank you for allowing me to be here this morning. Uh, this may be the first morning that you have heard my name or seen my face or heard my voice, but I've known a lot about you for a very long time. Okay, not individually, that's kind of creepy. But you as Harvest, I have been following the work and the ministry of this congregation for years. So I was brought on staff about a year ago, and um, I sat down and I met with Mark Sorensen my first week here. We sat down for coffee. <coughs> Excuse me. We sat down for coffee, and the reason I sat down for coffee with Mark Sorensen is I wanted to get to know this man. I wanted to get to know this man that I had followed for a long time. I wanted to hear his story, figure out what made him tick. But more than any of that, I wanted to see how many espresso shots he had to fit into his coffee to be able to have the energy that that man has. And so I, I sit down with Mark, and uh, we talk for a little bit, get to know one another. And finally, I stop about 10 minutes in. I say, Mark, i got to stop you right there, buddy. I said, Mark, this has been weighing on me pretty heavily. i got to confess something to you. Kind of taken aback, his hair goes a little bit higher, and, and he says, well, we just met, you're going to confess some deepest, darkest secret to me? And I said, yeah, kind of, here's what I need to confess to you, Mark. I said, Mark, I've been stealing, borrowing ideas from you and Harvest for a very long time. And he said, well, what do you mean? And I said, uh, you remember that Mr. Rogers sermon series that you did? Anybody remember in the neighborhood? Yeah, that was a great one. I said, yeah, we stole that. I said, you remember all of those names of God that are all around in the sermon series that went along with that? He said, yeah. I said, yeah, we stole that. I said, Mark, you have been shaping my ministry so much, not just with sermon series and, and sermon ideas and illustrations, but um, my, my previous church, we came to the harvest for an event, and we saw that these giant campfire candle things that you have. And I said, we went back and we bought them. We even stole your candles, man. I said, Mark, I'm sorry, but you just got to know that, that this community is shaping me. It's shaping ministries. It's shaping churches and communities and pastors all throughout the globe. And so I hope you understand that. And so that's my way of saying thank you for impacting my ministry, even though this may be the first time that you're ever seeing me. Uh, so Mark is in Louisiana this morning. He is visiting his son and daughter-in-law out there. And so anytime I, I get to uh, be in somebody else's pulpit, I like to make sure I honor them appropriately and brag on them. And since Mark isn't here, he can't get mad at me and throw things when I talk for too long about how great he is. He's humble. So, so here's the deal. You get to see Mark Sorensen up here every Sunday. You get to see his passion. You get to see his energy. You get to see his zeal, his command of the scripture. I don't know anybody who knows scripture as well as Mark Sorensen does. It's incredible. But see, you see him on Sunday mornings. I get to see him on Tuesdays and Wednesdays and Thursdays and Fridays. I get to see him throughout the week. And the highest compliment that I can give Mark Sorensen, and it's the honest to goodness truth, is that the man that you see up here preaching on Sunday morning is the exact same man I see on Tuesday morning in clergy meetings. It's the exact same man I see in his office when I bring to him a problem and I'm not the only one that does. It's the exact same man. It's the exact same man that I see interact with church members at some of their darkest and even their most beautiful moments. That man is a man of integrity. He is a man of honesty. He is a man who walks the walk and he talks the talk and he is who you see up here. And I tell you, I, I cannot be more excited to follow after a senior pastor like that who is rooted in scripture, who is rooted in a love for the Lord and he loves you so much too. He, he is a man that I cannot wait to follow for many, many years to come as he takes our church into the future. An incredible man of God. Not to mention the, the rest of the staff, the team that you have here. Uh, Susan Kent, 
So I told this story at the last service. Susan hadn't heard this before. Um, but, but when I arrived here on staff, I began kind of looking around and seeing, it kind of seems like Susan does everything around here. I was like, every church event, every big meeting, every email I seem to get is from this Susan Kent lady. And so uh, she didn't know this till after, till, till last service, but I pulled a couple of pastors aside about two weeks in and I said, hey guys, it kind of seems like Susan does everything around here and y'all just kind of sit around. Is that how it goes? And they said, oh yeah, 100%, she does everything around here. One of the most hardworking individuals I have ever met. She's the first one here. She's the last one out. She is raising up next generation Christian leaders. She's an incredible role model, and you are so thankful to have her. We'll clap for her because she's here. Mark's not. Uh, Lastly, I'll brag on this worship team that y'all have out here. Y'all, come on, right? Unreal. Uh, They don't do it for the glory. They don't do it for the applause. They don't do it for the praise. They do it because they love you and they love Jesus. Brenna Bullock. Okay, I know. Is she in this service? She was in the last one I was bragging on her. I don't think she is. Brenna Bullock, incredible musician, incredible singer, incredible leader of this team. What you might not know is that Brenna doesn't have a reverend in front of her name. She's not an ordained pastor, but Brenna is one of my favorite pastors on staff. Okay, the way this woman leads people, the way this woman has spoken truths into my life that I needed to hear at dark, dark moments, she is a powerhouse of spiritual authority and power, and I love her to death. I love this team. I love this space. That's my way of saying thank you for letting me be here. Now, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I am a fast-talking 30-year-old from South Fort Worth. Uh, I am a fighting Texas Aggie, class of 2014, a... It doesn't get old. Uh, My previous church was in College Station, so we got a lot of whoops. So I was worried coming down to the Woodlands what it would be like. And this is just College Station South. It's amazing. It's great. Uh, I'm a Duke Blue Devil as well. But more than any of that, what is most important is my beautiful family. So God has entrusted me with three amazing women. And I think we've got a little picture of them right there. Yeah, let's clap for them, right? Real heroes of the show, my wife is here this morning. If you don't like the sermon, I mean, just think of them, right? You gotta like it. Uh, So this is my wife, Alex. We've been married just over seven years. To her left on your right is Grayson. Uh, Grayson just turned four, going on 14. And then our uh, little baby down there is almost two now. This is an older picture, and that's Cameron. Uh, If you see smoke start coming from the nursery, it was the four-year-old, okay? I'll, I'll just go ahead and tell you. Uh, but they are the joys of our life. It's amazing to be a father. And if you have kids at this age of life or if you've ever had kids at this age of life, you know how incredibly exciting and exhilarating and exhausting it can be. Okay, we are constantly running around the house. Get that out of your mouth. Stop doing that for your sister. Where did you, put, where did you get that and why is it on your head? This is a constant occurrence in the lumpy household. But I tell you, one of the things I love most about this stage of life is to see in their faces, in their eyes, in their minds, their imagination. I tell you, for just a moment, I would love to have just a fraction of the imagination of a four-year-old. Uh, There's something about life and being an adult that kind of crushes us down and and, and makes us not imagine and dream and vision as much as before. And then I see our daughters and and I see a life full of possibilities, full of imagination. So a couple of weeks ago, my wife, Alex, was out running errands and I was was sitting, um, I was on daddy duty. It's not babysitting if they're your children, men. I, I, I was on daddy duty. And it made it pretty easy because Cameron, our youngest, was upstairs taking a nap. So I just had four-year-old, and four-year-old loves Bluey. Do we know Bluey? Some Bluey fans in the house? You know Bluey if you have young children. He's my favorite uh, blue Australian dog in the world. Um, That makes sense to four of you. But uh, So we're in the living room, Grayson and I, and we're watching some Bluey. And um, I'm sitting there scrolling on my phone on Instagram or something. And I said, you know what? Today... I'm going to be a good husband. Doesn't happen every day. Don't say amen. Doesn't happen every day. But I said, today, I'm going to be a good husband. I'm not just going to scroll through my phone. I'm going to go do something productive. And and so I get up. I leave Grayson in the living room. I go into our bedroom. My wife has done a lot of laundry. It is stacked up um, on on our our bed. And then I also have that clean clothes pile. Men, do you know what I'm talking about? 
The stuff that's clean, I just haven't put it up yet. And I decided I'm going to clean all of that. I'm going to be a really good husband. And so I spend a few minutes in there. I hang up clothes. I fold clothes. I put it away. I get everything all ready. I gather up another load of laundry. Hello. Doing a good job here. And and, and I get ready and I walk out of our uh, bedroom into our living room with this bundle of laundry. And I was gone no more than five minutes. And in those five minutes, a tornado had struck our house. Somehow, an atom bomb with the exact size of our living room went off right there. No less than five minutes. I I, I look around and I see piles of baby dolls and piles of horses and piles of food. There's like Cheez-Its and gummy bears in there for some reason. And then I see that our four-year-old has taken all of the pillows and all of the cushions off of our big sectional sofa. And they are now all around the living room. And so I, I put on my best fun, stern dad voice. Because I want to be the fun dad, but I got to be the stern dad too. It's an art. And so I said, hey, Grayson, why did you make such a mess? It's a question I ask far too often. Hey, Grayson, why did you make such a mess? And I'll never forget, she said, dad, this isn't a mess. It's a castle. She said, it's my castle. And I said, you built all this in five minutes? That's pretty impressive. And so she proceeds to take me by the hand and show me the parts of her castle. She shows me that that this pile of baby dolls is not a pile of baby dolls. That's the bedroom. She takes me to the pile of horse toys. That's not a pile of horse toys. That's the stable. She takes me to the Cheez-Its and gummy bears and says, Dad, this is the kitchen. And then she walks me all around the edge of our living room. And what was once pillows and cushions is now the wall to her castle. See, where I saw a mess, where I saw chaos, where I saw an atom bomb going off, my four-year-old saw a kingdom. Where I saw destruction, she saw opportunity. When I saw something that was broken, she saw something that was beautiful. And what I came to talk to you about this morning is having that kind of faith is having that kind of vision that where the rest of the world just seems a broken world full of messed up people, you can look and see the planting of the kingdom of God here in our midst. What would it look like to see those kinds of opportunities? And what would it look like to not just see them, but then raise up and realize that God is calling you to raise up and be a part of the work that he is already doing in our midst? What would that look like for us? And so this morning, I'm just going to give you a really quick four-point sermon. Mark said he usually does three. I go for extra credit. So four things. Four ways to be a kingdom builder. Four ways that if you want to have vision for what it looks like to build people, what it looks like to see opportunities, four things I believe we see very clearly in Nehemiah chapter 2 of what Nehemiah does to be a visionary, to be a kingdom builder. And the first thing he does is this. You've got to begin with boldness. Nehemiah and you and I, if we are called to do the work that God has called us to do, we've got to begin with boldness. It doesn't start from a place of timidity, but it comes from a place of stepping up and saying, I see something and I'm going to be the one to do something about it. Look with me at Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1. It begins in the month of Nisan. Pause here. If you, don't, if you aren't familiar with ancient Persian calendars, this is, is pretty significant. Uh, the month of Nisan came immediately after the month of Honda. You know, in preacher jokes, I always try to get the uh, laugh to groan ratio. I feel like that was more groans this time than laughs. That's fine. Some of you will be laughing about that later this afternoon. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when the wine was before him, I took up the wine and I gave it to the king. Now, I had not been sad in his presence. And the king said to me, why is your face sad, seeing that you're not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid, and I said to the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruin, and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Now, on first glance here, this may not seem like a particularly bold move by Nehemiah. It just seems like a guy having a conversation with the king. But, but we get a little clue in there because it says that Nehemiah had not been sad in the presence of the king. 
And we likely know that to be true because Nehemiah was still alive. In this time period, it was a crime, often punishable by death, to appear sad in front of the king. See, they believed that the king had, had God-like qualities. He was God's representative, kind of God's icon on the planet. And so to appear sad in his presence would almost be like saying, you're not God. And so many of them would be killed. Nehemiah could have been killed for this moment, but he steps up in boldness. And then we've got to remember, too, that, that Nehemiah, this very act that he's doing, is quite bold. He's a cupbearer. So Mark talked about this last week. A cupbearer has some influence. He was a man of integrity, but he doesn't really have a lot of authority. A cupbearer, their main job was to taste the wine before the king drank it. And the main reason for that was to see whether or not the wine was poisonous. It was a job with a high turnover rate. We'll put it that way. So Nehemiah was not a prophet, he was not a priest, he was not a king, he was not a governor, he was not a mayor. He, he didn't have all kinds of college degrees, he didn't have all kinds of experience. He was a cupbearer. But yet still, he steps before in boldness this throne and, and says, I'm going to be sad because I want to do something about this issue I see. He comes from very low stature, but he knows that God is calling him to do something mighty. So the question this morning is this, what's your excuse? I'm a guest preacher, so I can step on your toes a little bit. What's your excuse? What's your excuse for not doing something mighty for the kingdom of God? What's your excuse for not stepping up into the places of leadership that God is calling you to step up into? What is your excuse for not serving, for not growing, for not doing things and rebuilding the walls of the kingdom? Maybe you say, I, I, I'm too young, I'm still learning this thing. Maybe you say, I, I'm too old, I can't be used by God. Maybe you say, I'm not educated enough, or I'm too busy, or, or maybe in the next season of life I will. Whatever your excuse to not have confidence in this stage of life, it's a bad excuse. Because here's the reality. You may not have confidence, you may not have boldness in your own abilities, but you don't have to. Because the one who goes before you, the one who goes behind you, the one that lives inside of you is strong enough and capable enough and confident enough to make up for all of your weaknesses. In our weakness, he is made strong. You gotta begin with boldness. Like Nehemiah to say, I'm not qualified for this. I may be stepping out of line, but God's put something on my heart and I'm gonna move forward in it. I believe that God's looking for that kind of leader, that kind of person here this morning. And to look for a leader that, that knows that it's not just about his own boldness. See, Nehemiah, he, he's, got, he's got some hubris, he's got some fight in him, but he knows that by himself he can do nothing, which is why the second thing you gotta see that he does, and the second thing if you wanna be a visionary is this, you gotta pause for prayer. You gotta pause for prayer. Look with me at the very next verse, verse four. Then the king said to me, what are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven. So, so notice what's just happened here. Let's, let's kind of translate that to modern times a little bit. The king of Persia, King Artaxerxes, has just asked this cupbearer, what do you want from me? What can I do for you? He has functionally given him a blank check. So today, what would that look like? You get a phone call this afternoon from the president, from the governor, from the mayor, from your CEO, from Bill Gates. And they ask you a question, hey, anything that you want, you've got it. What do you want? Now, your first question might be, how did you get this number? This is a little creepy. My preacher talked about this this morning. But your next thought may be, I, I know what I want. I've got a list kind of in the back of our mind, our genie in the bottle. If I ever win a lottery, this is what I'm going to do. You would probably know what you would want to do. And chances are, Nehemiah knew the decision that he needed to make, but he still pauses for prayer. He realizes that before he asks something on the throne of an earthly king, he's got to approach the throne of the God of heavens. And so I believe here he shoots out a quick prayer. 
Now I want you to watch all throughout this series how many times Nehemiah prays. If there is one reason I would ascribe to his leadership ability, it is because he's rooted and steeped and constantly praying. Sometimes he prays for hours, sometimes he prays for weeks. In fact, there's actually four months in between Nehemiah 1 and Nehemiah chapter 2. Four months, and most scholars believe that he was praying in that time discerning the will of God, doing really gritty, deep prayer, getting his knees bruised up, asking and requesting from the throne of God. But this quick prayer that we see here in Nehemiah chapter two, I don't think this was a long prayer. Maybe it's just me and we don't see it in the scriptures, but I don't think when Artaxerxes says, hey, what do you want from me? Here's your blank check. Nehemiah said, hey, Artie, thanks, buddy. Um, can I have like 15 minutes, right? Prayer closet's back there. I just really need to check and make sure that's okay. I don't think he did that. I believe what Nehemiah did in this moment is what I call a flare prayer. You know a flare prayer, right? Somebody online said at the last service, well, do we, uh, flare prayer and blaze praises. I love that. Flare prayer. Just a quick little shoot up to God. You probably prayed those. I know I have in my life. Before a test in high school, God, please let me pass this, flare prayer. Before asking my now wife to marry me, God, please let her say yes, flare prayer. Driving down 45 in the left lane. Somebody is also in the left lane, not going the speed limit, going below the speed limit in the fast lane. Dear, please, God, get this person out of this lane or so help me. Flare prayer. You've prayed that too. I'm not the only sinner here. See, the act of prayer, it doesn't really matter how long the prayer is. God loves it all. God loves to hear from his children, to guide his children, to speak to his children, and that happens in prayer. And so listen, with so many people here this morning and so many joining us online, I know that there's somebody facing a decision. Maybe it's a decision with your children. Maybe it's a decision in your career. Maybe it's a decision to leave this place and move somewhere else. Maybe it's a decision with finances. I don't know what the decision is, but there's chances are there's somebody struggling with the decision. And my real simple question for you this morning is, have you prayed about it? Have you prayed about it? Have you spent time on your knees asking for God's guidance, asking for God's direction? God wants to be intimately involved in every decision that you make. He loves you that much. Whether it's a long prayer or a flare prayer, make sure that every decision is soaked in prayer. And Nehemiah does that. He spends this time in prayer. And even if it's a quick flare prayer, he gets an answer back. And we see in verse 5. It says, and I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's gates, that I may rebuild it. So if you're keeping up with the narrative here, Nehemiah had only been told that the gates, that the walls of Jerusalem were broken. He had messengers, relatives of him come and say, hey, the situation is pretty bad. And now Nehemiah asked to go and see it for himself. That's the third step in being a visionary and being a kingdom builder. See the situation. See the situation. If you want to fix something, if you want to be a kingdom builder, you've got to see with your own eyes what you're dealing with. This is what he does in verse 11. So I went to Jerusalem and and I was there three days. This was some 800 miles from where he was. Then I arose in the night, I and a few men with me. And I told no one what my God had put onto my heart to do for Jerusalem. He says, there was no animal with me but the one on which I rode. And I went out by night to the valley gate, to the dragon spring, and to the dung gate, a stinky place, I might add. And I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. We could keep going. He goes all around, north, south, east, west, lays his eyes on the destruction of the city of his ancestors. He doesn't just want to hear about the situation. He wants to see the situation for himself, and so he does. Now, when you see a situation that is broken, just as Nehemiah did, when you see that walls have been broken down, you can really respond in one of two ways. You can either respond in fear or you can respond in faith. 
You can look at the brokenness of this world and it is a broken world and you can think, this is so messed up. I want no part of it. I'm scared for my future. I'm scared for my church's future. I'm scared for my children's future. Or by God's strength, you can respond in faith and say, this may be broken, but God isn't done with us yet. This may be broken, but God is calling up leaders. He may even be calling up me to lead towards the future. You can respond in fear or you can respond in faith. I've been told an old preacher's story. I don't know whether or not it's true. But it comes from the 1800s when Europe was beginning to colonize the continent of Africa. And so many European businesses realized that this could be an opportunity to earn some extra money. And so there was a shoe company in Europe that wanted to send two salesmen to Africa to figure out whether or not there was a market for their shoes. So he sent out two salesmen, this boss did, one to the western coast of Africa and one to the eastern coast of Africa. And within about a day, he got a letter back, a telegram back from the first one in western Africa. And the salesman said this, I'm returning home on the next boat. There's no opportunity here. The people don't wear shoes. Now, a couple days later, that boss received the telegraph from the second salesman out east. And the second salesman said a very similar thing, but with a very different conclusion. He said, send millions of shoes. Every size, every color, every shape, every style. There is ample opportunity here. The people don't wear shoes. Same situation, same problem, two different responses. When you see the situation of the brokenness in our midst, when you see the situation of the brokenness inside of your own spirit, how are you going to respond, in fear or in faith? And no surprise, because we're looking at Nehemiah. Nehemiah does a good job. And he sees the problem, but more than that, he sees a solution. He sees by faith. And he says, I'm going to do something about it. And that's the fourth thing you've got to understand. If you want to be a visionary, if you want God to use you to build his kingdom, you've got to go do the good work. It's not enough to pray about it. It's not enough to be bold. It's not enough to even see it for yourself. God is calling you to go and do the good work. Look at Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 17. Nehemiah says, then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. How Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. He says, come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. And I told them on the hand of my God that had been upon me for good and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And so they said, let us rise up and let us build. And so they strengthened their hands for the good work. Somebody say the good work. The good work work. Thank you. Love that. See, Nehemiah goes down. He sees the problem. But then he takes the next step and says, I'm going to put my thoughts, I'm going to put my dreams, I'm going to put the vision that God has put inside my heart into action. Now, what you've got to remember is that the walls being burned down, the walls being broken was not Nehemiah's fault. He wasn't the one who destroyed it. He wasn't even in the city when they were destroyed. See, it wasn't his problem But Nehemiah stepped in and said, I'm going to make it my burden. See, I think it's so easy to live in a culture where we see a problem. We say, that's not my problem. Right? What if Nehemiah had walked around these walls and said, man, this infrastructure is a big problem. I wonder if DC is going to get it together. Or what if he said, you know what? Hashtag campaign. We're going to start this. Rebuild the wall. If I can just use my my fingers, my thumbs enough, then we can raise up enough support and somebody else will do it. Nehemiah doesn't play the blame game. He doesn't push it off onto somebody else. Instead, he said, this may not be my problem, but I'm going to be part of the solution. And I wonder if there's somebody here today that sees a problem that your heart breaks for something. And it might not be your problem, but God is calling you here and now to be a part of the solution to rise up no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, and say, God can use me if I will just make myself available to him. Even if you're not a part of the problem, you can be a part of the solution. So the question that Mark asked you last week is, is what breaks your heart? What do you have a burden for? 
Where is that holy discontent that you look around and you say, something isn't right here. What is it for you? What I love about the kingdom of God, the body of Christ, is that what breaks your heart is going to be different from what breaks my heart. And that's okay because God wants to use you and God wants to use me to build all of his kingdom here. So what breaks your heart? Maybe it's when you look out on the world. Maybe it breaks your heart that somewhere between 38 and 46 million people are currently enslaved in human trafficking. To put that into context, that's one out of every 200 human beings made in the image of God whom Jesus died for is a slave today. Maybe it breaks your heart that in America, more than 38 million people go hungry. Maybe it's the fact that across the globe, over 7,000 people die every day from preventable diseases. What breaks your heart? Or maybe your heart is breaking for what's happening locally. Maybe it's the fact that 60,000 people in Montgomery County, in the shadow of our steeple, are food insecure. Maybe it breaks your heart that in the greater Houston area, over 3,000 people are unsheltered, are homeless. Maybe it breaks your heart that just down the road, prisoners are released with a bus ticket and 50 bucks to told to go figure out the rest of their life. No job prospects, no training, no place to live. What breaks your heart? Maybe this morning you feel that heartbreak not from looking out into the world, but looking into your own soul. And realizing that the walls of your heart, they might have been strong at one point. You might have been lockstep in your growth and grace of the Lord. But now you look at yourself and you say, I don't know what happened. This sin, this pattern, this habit, this way that I've been acting is not how I am called to act. These walls are broken. What if God is calling you this morning to commit to do the good work? the good work of repentance, of growing in him. What if God is calling you to do that in your own spirit? Now here's what's amazing, and we'll close with this, is that what we just read from Nehemiah, I challenged you and said, this is a story about you. This is a story of God raising up a next generation of Christian leaders to build his kingdom here. It's about you. It's also about Nehemiah. Obviously, his name's on the book. But this story in Nehemiah chapter two is not a story just of us. It's not just a story of Nehemiah. I believe that every story in the Bible is not just about what's in the black and white, but it's about somebody greater. See, the story of Nehemiah is about a greater Nehemiah that's to come. A greater Nehemiah who saw a problem and was the solution even though he didn't cause it. See, the story of the gospel is this, that God looked down on you and on me and on broken, sinful humanity and saw us in our sin and saw us in our death and saw that we could have no communion, no relationship with him. God didn't cause that, you and I did. Every time we choose our own way, every time we veer from the path that God has laid for us, we choose to sin. But God said, I'm gonna come down there. God said, I'm not gonna let them die. I'm not just gonna leave them to figure it out. But God said, I might not be the problem, but I'm going to be the solution. And so the story of the gospel is that God came down in Jesus Christ, put on flesh, lived and dwelt among us, lived the perfect life that you could never live, died the death that we deserved to do the good work of restoring our relationship with the Father. It wasn't his fault. It wasn't his problem. But by the cross and by the empty tomb and his blood shed for us, we have the great good work, the solution to our problems. The walls have been restored and we can now have full communion, full relationship with the Father. So every time you and I will step up and say, I'm gonna build a kingdom. I'm gonna help build the kingdom here. I might not be a part of the problem, but I'm gonna be a part of the solution. Every time we do that, you step in the footsteps, not just of Nehemiah, but of Jesus Christ himself. We live like him, we step like him, we do what he said to go and do likewise. We pray for us. God, we thank you that you have called us. We thank you that you have equipped
equipped us. We thank you for the boldness that you give us through Jesus Christ. We thank you that by his life, death, and resurrection, you have won the big victory. You have won the final fight, and now we just get to step into your truth and step into your victory. God, I pray that you're stirring up hearts, that you are giving us burdens even here and now for what you are calling us to do. God, we love you, we praise you, we thank you for Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.